All right, so this is the um, this is the core Q and A session, which is very casual, um, as you may if you've if you've been to these before. Um, it's an opportunity to ask us questions about anything that's on your mind, so relative to Drupal core. Um, before we get started, maybe we can go uh, do quick intros, uh, so you know who the different people are here uh, on stage. Maybe Gabor. Let's start with Gabor and then go this way. Sure, so I'm the Drupal 6 maintainer. I committed three patches to Drupal 8, I think, uh, in the past few years. Um, I work as a lead of the multilingual initiative and also do a little bit of Drupal 8 marketing. So I ignited the Drupal 8 page on Drupal.org, for example. I'm Nathaniel Kachpo, Kach on Drupal.org. I work for Tagline Consulting. I'm the Drupal 8 branch maintainer. Hi, I'm Alex Pott. Spot on Twitter. Um, I work for Chapter Three. I'm a Drupal Eight maintainer, and I'm also the maintainer of the configuration management system. Um, yeah, so I'm. If you don't want to chat, I'm a freelancer, and I'm uh, the maintainer of the, the maintainer of the field API. I'm William Leers. I'm working at Acquia. Worked on Spark and things within Spark, and now working on Drupal Eight performance. It's funny you say Lears. <laughs> yeah. You, you English, English, if I your your name, <laughs> because otherwise people can't pronounce it. <laughs> what do you say? What is your name actually? Lears. Lears, Wim Lears, or Wim Lears. <laughs> um, so I'm Jess. I'm XJM on Drupal.org. Um, I worked on the Views and Drupal Core initiative, the <coughs> Core Contribution Mentoring Program. Um, and I now also work at Acquia doing um, a lot of, my, my title is Code and Community Strategist. I do a lot of sort of release management, um, code review, and so forth um, with the goal of getting Drupal 8 released. And, uh, my name is Dreis. <laughs> 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 um, so just to get it going here, um, as, you, as you may remember from my keynote, I solicited feedback from you know, everybody in the community asking me questions about you know, anything they wanted, really. And some of these questions I didn't actually get to in the keynote, but I related to Drupal 8 core. So to kick it off, I'm going to ask um, our panel here a few of those questions, because I think they're relevant not just to me, but to ask from you know to them as well. And then after that, we'll flip it around. And obviously, you guys can go to the mic and uh, ask you know whatever question you want. So let's start with the first question. Um, and so that question was, is there any lessons learned from the Drupal 8 release cycle so far? And obviously, we're not done yet, but um, you know, we are three years or more into it. And there may be some, uh, some lessons learned here. So I don't know if anyone on the panel wants to, uh, wants to jump in here. Crickets. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll start. Um, <laughs> for me, like one of the top lessons that, that I've learned um, during the Drupal 8 cycle is don't quit your job and tell Dries. Um, <laughs> <coughs> because then you might end up working all your time on, on core. But, but more seriously, is, it's the fact that um, changing core is taking longer and longer. Um, and that's because we're trying to do more. We're trying to build a more full-featured Drupal that serves the needs of all of our users and developers. So core is professionalizing, and it's taking longer. And we've got to change our community to react to that. Because we can't just rely on the intrinsic motivations of developers to contribute back. Because just putting a patch on Drupal.org isn't enough anymore. We've got to take it through. We've got to make sure it's well tested. We've got to make sure it fits in with the rest of the designs for the system. <coughs> and, and there's a lot more work than just having a good idea and, and putting it up on Drupal.org. And so <coughs> how we're going to help that, that happen in the future is, is one of the key challenges that, that going forward, we're going to need to change for me. Awesome. Any others? Well, yeah. It's probably kind of connected for me. I, I guess it would have been the, the importance of having a, uh, building a team around subsystems. Like, It's very, very hard to maintain or, and to, to grow a, 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 a subsystem like if there is only one or two developers like uh, working on it in the long run, uh, one of the differences uh, between the D7 cycle and, and the D8 cycle was that 
like in, in, in the design cycle when the initial after the initial field API patch got committed, there was there was basically two developers polishing it. Uh, me and Barry Jaspan uh, back then. Then it was like mostly me for the, the the end of the cycle, and it was like kind of really hard because well, if you write a patch, who will understand and review it? Um, and the big difference in the D8 cycle is that like we have been like six. There has been six or five or, 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 or seven people like being able to work on the entity field. Uh, component and that makes like a big difference because well you can work as a team you can when someone leaves the other can 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 uh, move forward to and, and, and reviewing each other's works and and moving together in, 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 in the same direction makes things immensely easier but like having five or six people stick around for the the, the, the current duration of a Drupal development cycle like two or three years, it's kind of, yeah, how do we do that? Gabor has some, uh, some thoughts. Yeah, so uh, continuing that thought, or these two thoughts, uh, what I think we found in Drupal 8 that we uh, didn't do before is that uh, we need to communicate what we do better uh, with the rest of, uh, of the community interested in what's going on. So we started these Q and A's. We started uh, this week and then this month in Drupal Core, um, and we started having uh, putting out information about what's coming up, so that people know what's going on and where uh, can they help, and that helped uh, involving more people and and pointing out what are our priorities and what we need help with, and I think we've been improved on that a lot um, in this cycle. Yeah, and I'll tag on to that as well. Like, you know, people ask me whether I think the notion of initiatives worked, because that's something that we introduced in the Drupal 8 cycle, didn't exist before Drupal 8. And so my, my reaction to that is that it did work. Like, I think it really helped on a number of fronts, like communicating sort of a roadmap for Drupal, even though it's not like a roadmap that most people know, it did communicate sort of the key areas of work, you know, whether it's mobile and you know, Spark and CMI and, you know, all of the other initiatives that we had. And it, I do think it aligned people or rallied people into contributing to these, you know, buckets of work, if you will. Um, but where we also um, can learn from Drupal 8 is that I think the initiatives that have been uh, successful um, are the ones where there was... Um, a leader that can you know rally the troops and you know provide that level of communication and the initiatives that haven't been that successful we were sometimes missing that component that doesn't mean that the person that was heading up the initiative you know isn't a great person it just meant that we need to think about how can we make sure that sort of the initiative leadership is well rounded um, so that we have technical strength but also you know, people that are good at communicating and people that are good at project managing and, and all of these check boxes need to be checked. So for me, if we decide to, to you know, do the initiatives again, I would, you know, try and think hard about how do we recruit maybe not one person but a small team of people that can sort of run with these initiatives because um, it's a lot to ask from, from one person often, so. All right, maybe we should move on to the second question. Unless other people, all right. Uh, so the second question is, uh, what what's some of the things you would like to, um, that that you would like to to see changed personally uh, in Drupal eight? Um, sorry, hold on. Uh, uh, all right, uh, I'm going to jump to the third question. Sorry. Um, uh, so a lot of people asking about how do you, um, how do you best prepare for Drupal eight? Like, you know, we're talking about Drupal 8, how do you prepare your site, how do you prepare your skill set maybe? And so any, any suggestions or thoughts from the core team here? So, um, so if, you're, if you're doing site building, um, you should consider at this point, like, Exploratory site building with Drupal 8, not just testing, but if you're prepared to drop your, all of your data and rebuild your site again, um, you can build sites that way and just react to API changes until there's an upgrade path. Um, I think a lot of people are like, when when can I start using it? 
or, or they ask when it's going to be out and when it's going to be like a release candidate and what they mean is when can I start using it and you can start using it now if you're competent and if you're prepared to kind of very honestly confront the extra work that you'll need to do. Um, so I'd encourage people to start looking at that, like do it carefully and be aware of the risks and the fact that we will break your data. But you can, like, you can, if you can just install each time, then it will run fine. Um, anyone else? Um, I think it would in indeed would be very valuable if site builders start testing now, especially if you can try to do those things that you very typically very often do in Drupal 7 today, because maybe some things work much better, maybe some things work a little bit in an unexpected way, but now is still the time to report those things because maybe we can still address those things or take them into account. Um, a particular variant of this is if you have a Drupal 6 site that you're looking at, um, according to our new rele release cycle and end of life, probably six months after the release of 8.0.0, um, I would highly recommend that you try to build out your Drupal 6 site in Drupal 8, see what functionality you have, see what functionality you need to wait for contrib for, because a lot of functionality that was reliant on contributed modules is now available from Drupal core. Um, so try to build out your Drupal 6 site as much as you can and then test um, the migration path that's actually available in Drupal core now. It doesn't have a user interface yet, um, and it's, it's not completely supported yet, but it's, it's mostly there. So what you can do is you can use, for example, Drush to migrate your content from your existing Drupal 6 site, which can stay in production and keep running right up until whenever you actually do develop in Drupal 8. Just test migrating that into a new <coughs> Drupal 8 site that you've prototyped. And, and see how far you can get and see what's missing. That's a really great way to plan resources and say, okay, with this, this thing with, that we did in Drupal 6, we can do it in this different way, but we really need something like this contributed module in Drupal 8, and so maybe we're going to look into, um, we're going to follow the development of that module, we're going to try to support or participate in the development of that module. That's what I would recommend. Any other thoughts? By the way, before Alex starts to answer, like maybe after this answer, we're going to start taking questions from the audience. So if you guys have questions, feel free to start, you know, lining up at the mic, um, and then we'll switch over. And obviously, the, there's just a few really obvious things. If you, if you're a PHP developer, it, it's it's time to start thinking about object orientation. If you visit, like, there's a site called PHP the Right Way. We we follow a lot of the the same like common practices that are outlined there. If you're a themer, it's time to be thinking about Twig and having a look at how that works. Um, there's, there's a big change that's going to happen on the theme layer called the Consensus Banana um, series of patches. If you want to check that out and see what's going on there. It's Just three minutes, one of them actually, two minutes ago. Ah, so it's cla Classy's in core. It is, yeah. So, so yeah, we have a new base theme in core called Classy. So if. Yeah. Did, I uh, did I miss something? I just I committed it from from here. Yeah, just. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you don't have to worry about more well, while Gabriel was entering, I just committed it. <laughs> <laughs> but I did commit it just before I, I took the mic. So. <laughs> um. Yeah. Cool. So so if you're if you're a themer, it, 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 there's there's a whole new way of thinking about how how you you base your theme. If you don't want any of like cause HTML or classes, then you you just don't base your theme on Classy. Um, so you can have like that clean mark, clean dream markup you've always been looking for. No, um, not yet. <laughs> yeah. Well, in, in the future. Like, don't base it on your get the classes, and then when we remove the classes, they right. won't be there. Yeah, yeah. But if you, if you do this and you see the classes, it's because those patches haven't all gone yet. <laughs> yeah. uh, you, you can start not using Classy now, but please don't be disappointed when you still see lots of classes because they haven't actually been removed yet, but they will by the time we get there. So just pretend that they're not there. That's <laughs> the theme layer isn't going to be frozen until um, closer to the fresh release candidate. So. And, and one more group that I think is uh, is quite interesting from the D8 perspective is the, is the content strategist. Um, like we've we've now got a full featured entity API in core, which means that when you're the, you're modeling your sites. Just think in terms of entities, like, and and your developers and themers will be able to take that and model that, without going, oh, should this be a node or not? Like, everything is an entity, and then when you when it, when it's an entity, you're going to get a whole lot of good stuff that Gabriel's probably about to tell you about. Uh, 
No, I want to actually point out uh, developer things. So there's some great speakers doing talks around how to use tools that you will use in Drupal 8 in your Drupal 7 projects. So you are to do Drupal 7 projects. It's totally possible to integrate Composer, PHP Unit, a lot of other tools. And you can get to learn them one by one instead of the whole thing at once. And then apply that knowledge to Drupal 8 if you want. Uh, I personally know that FGM, Frederick Morong, has a talk on that. I'm not sure if she did that talk here, but it's certainly recorded and available on the internet <coughs> how to use uh, some of the Drupal 8 tools on Drupal 7. Also, if you're a contributed module author, or if there's a contributed module that you depend on for your site and you're not the author, um, you should come to our module upgrade lab this afternoon, which will help you port either your very own module or a module that you care about to Drupal 8. We'll show you some tools that are available to do that. Um, this is a really great strategy if you're worried about um, some contrib after, after Drupal 8.0.0 is released, is to start, that we have a beta now, so now is a good time to start porting it. Um, you shouldn't expect, though, that you can port it once and walk away. You, you will need to update your port again at some point, probably before a release candidate. But uh, now, is, now is the good time to start that. We'll show you some tools. Um, and the more contrib we can get done by the time 8.0.0 ships, the more, um, the, the earlier that new sites will be able to build on, on Drupal 8 using all of the, the stuff that was available for you in Drupal 7. Um, so that's this afternoon at 1 p.m. Awesome. Uh, right. More? Just one oh, tiny good. tidbit. We all have advice. To take on to that. <coughs> um, so developers, indeed, porting your module or modules you care about or that you depend on heavily, Porting those is very useful, and I think the best way to start learning to do APIs, because instead of being overwhelmed by the many things that are new, that have changed, you can begin in those areas that you're already familiar with, and then you can build upon that. So starting with the things you already know, learning about those changes makes it easier to then learn the rest as well, I think. Great, thank you very much. Um, so at this point, I'd like to see if there's any questions from people in the room here, because um, if you have a question, feel free to, you know, best to a ask it in the mic so everybody can hear it, and so it's also recorded. Um, so, and, and please introduce yourself real quick. It's always helpful. Um, okay, um, my name is Christian. I'm from Berlin. The company mostly does, or my company does, mostly does uh, medium-sized e-government projects. Um, I have a somewhat less serious question and a somewhat more serious question. Um, the less serious one is the one I actually asked the exact same panel last year in Prague. Uh, if you were supposed to bet money on the release date. <laughs> uh, last year you kind of skipped that question. Maybe this year. My answer was so good. <laughs> so you stick with it? I don't remember your answer. I'll, I'll let other people. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so the crickets again. <laughs> All right. it again, so maybe other people don't remember. Well, maybe uh, maybe give us your serious question, and we can think a little bit about that question <laughs> in, as we uh, as we move on. <laughs> well, the somewhat more serious question yeah. is that um, this is really low. Um, Right now, very often uh, we would use features, or I would use features to, I don't know, export some view, um, export some content type, something like that. And uh, more often than not, uh, us or the client would see something that he wants to change, and so I would simply jump in and uh, use a little hook to change a little thing. So usually the module files will not be very long, it's like five or six, seven hooks, and that's it. So maybe it's like less than a thousand lines of code. Uh, what I've seen now with Symfony seems really intimidating to me, and it seems like, oh my god, I want to change something small, and I will have to go through some really crazy stuff to actually do that. Um, would you, what would you think about that fear, this being intimidated? You know, will I still be able to simply jump in? S yesterday, somebody, um, I can't remember who, but you know, was kind of prospecting a future where there will be no more modules and will just be. PHP components and a symphony, and it seemed really scary. So, a lot of the small tweaks that you would do in, like, a say, a 200 line module were things like hook form water or hook entity view water or something like that, and those have fundamentally not changed compared to Drupal 7. You can still go in and you can change small things in a form, 
and you can still go in and you can change views and field for or add a new field formatter and stuff like that and like it might be that instead of like instead of all adding a new format that's in a hook you add it in a plugin but those plugins are much easier to write once you've written one so for those kinds of small tweaks I depending on what the tweak is <coughs> some of them you won't even see that much difference some of them will be, make a lot more sense for some of the small tweaks that are actually really really complicated and relied on side effects and things like that which like doing weird things in hook in it some of that is going to be much harder but those are usually things that people shouldn't have been doing or were only doing because that was the only way to do things. So it's it's going to be a bit of both, but it's not like suddenly you have to go and like write six classes. You you don't. You can still do little autos and hooks, and you can also write like quite simple plugins and switch things to use them, and everything's in that one file. So it depends what you want to do, but I wouldn't. Like, don't panic. And uh, will it? Probably stay like that for the foreseeing future, or is there will you kind of it's abandon the whole hook concept? No, the, no, not no, not in Drupal eight. I don't in Drupal nine. The, the, it, there's there are inconsistencies in the way that you do certain things in Drupal eight that we need to resolve, but they they're not going to be resolved before Drupal eight releases. So when you do do certain things, it will be more complicated. You have to write event listeners, and that's something we're going to have to sort out for the next one. But the replacing the whole system is not going to happen before release. Like if you write a hook implementation now, it's still going to work unless you're unlucky and we take it that particular one away. Okay. It, it's kind of a, a, of a requirement. Well, in, in the issues I've been involved with, like we've been very careful about not removing any um, um, integration point, extension point, like hooks, like because that's that's what we do in Drupal. I mean. We do things, and we always did with the, the the thought in mind that yeah, but some people will want something different, slightly different, or completely different. So, like, uh, any time there was a major or semi-major refactoring, like one of the question requirements was we add those extension points earlier. How do we preserve them, or how do we leave them in place, or find a new shape for them, or maybe make them easier? So, like, we definitely try to keep the, the those extension points in place and one of the efforts was like making uh, uh, making it easier to just swap up uh, swap out like big uh, implementations like make it easier to have a completely different entity storage mm -hmm. or make it easier to like to swap out entire parts of the system that's very much what the, what the uh, serv service container and object orientation it was about so if anything, it sh you should be able to swap out much more things than in D7. That might not be always easy to do or easy to find how to do it. Uh, but like, the, I, I think the hooks that were in place uh, in, in D7 are mostly still there in one way or, or the other. So here's a personal testimonial. Um, so I've been very freaked out of the complexity of some of those Drupal 8 things, and I told Dries that, that Drupal 8 is on the wrong way. And he was like, yeah, well, well. So he's like take, taking this input and then uh, thinks about it. And then sometime later on, uh, I, I was paid to work on Drupal core modules to work on things as part of Spark. And then as part of my free time, I was working on Drupal 8 mod contrib modules for multilingual, and I built a Drupal 8 distro for multilingual. So I, I, I used a lot of those things. And what I found is that there are very clear patterns that repeat. So they are not the same patterns that there were in 7, but they are patterns. So once you learn some of those patterns, you can apply them across a lot of things. So they are just different patterns. There's no reason to be afraid. So I, I totally uh, came around to this now. I, I th so from my point of view, um, I mean, a lot of things changed. <coughs> and. Uh, because we switched to object-oriented programming and design patterns, the code is more verbose, and it looks like, wow, there's so much code, but there is not necessarily a direct correlation between the number of lines of code and complexity, right? Um, I think that's very important, because I can give you, say, an academic white paper that is 12 pages, which will take you, you know, two or three weeks to fully understand, or I can give you more of a book that is easy to read and you can you know read very fast through it so 
Um, I think a lot of people assume that more lines of code means, you know, it's more complex, but, um, you know, object-oriented as a whole, not just in Drupal, is more lines of code, but it also translates to, you know, more compo component-based architectures and, you know, easier to maintain if, it, if it's well-architected and designed. So um, I think it's, um, you know, I think it's <coughs> easy for people to, to, to get um, afraid, I guess. Um, but hopefully time will prove and show that um, a number of things actually get easier, even though it's more modules or more, more files and more lines of code. So. And, and just to add another anecdote to that, um, Jennifer Hodgton is updating her Drupal 7 book to Drupal 8, and she's, she's the type of developer who, who has voiced exactly the same concerns as you when she started um, the, the process of updating her book. She's like, everything's more complex. Um, how am I going to get, get, get scripts for this? But what she's found as, right, as through writing the book is that actually we're more consistent Things that were, were info hooks are now all plugins, and once you get used to the plugin system, it's like, wow, this thing that was just completely different before is now looking the same. I, I know how to do it. I got all the logic in one place, and and and, and maintaining the book for her, and like maintaining all the all the code in the in the book that she's she's written, she's written tests for it all, and she's like, wow, this is this is better, um, and and she's been pleasantly surprised. So. The other thing I'll, I'll quickly add, sorry, um, is that in Drupal 7 and before, you know, we we were very much um, like we would use hooks, right? But, and so, it, what's the word? Um, it, you know, it, it was by convention. Like a lot of things were by convention. And so you have to know the hooks, and if you implement the hook, you know, your function will be called. And in Drupal 8, it's more, uh, we use more, you know, declarative, declarative um, constructs, or actually, Specifically, have to say, you know, I want this to happen, um, which is more code, but it's also helpful because, you know, it's less magical in in a way. And so that is a little bit of a mind shift that we we made from seven to eight. Um, but in many cases, I think it's actually very useful. Yeah, I think Drupal eight in general is more strict, and because it is more strict, there is more verbosity. But the strictness also helps you find problems much easier than in Drupal 7 or before because there is less dark magic, less unstructured arrays of things, and that is going to be tremendously helpful. And it's already helping a lot in finding subtle errors because the subtle errors pop up immediately, whereas in Drupal 7 it was such a pain to find them. Uh, Angie said it well, actually, in the presentation um, this week. She said Drupal 7 has an array PI, <laughs> um, which, you know, we've actually <laughs> made a proper API instead of an array PI. Um, so, is there an, yeah, do you have another question? Um, no, uh, th thank you, first of all. Maybe that answers your question. <laughs> <laughs> thank Maybe you. you the yeah, so this first question was, any bets on release date? I don't know. I'm, I'm not ready to answer that personally, but maybe anyone else wants to take a crack at it. Um, so I, I will I will repeat like a qualified version of what I said in Prague, which is um, that, uh, well, uh, but I will add that in a way um, I am and a lot of us are betting money on Drupal 8's <laughs> release date being successful and soon. Um, it's my full time job. It's it's a couple other people up here's full time job also, um, and and we as an ecosystem we are betting money on it. Right, we're betting money on it every day. So I don't need to bet ten thousand dollars that someone gives me, um, and and gamble with it. I'm I'm already making a strategic investment. Is maybe a better way of phrasing it. Um, but the thing that I, I didn't want to do and then and is not as scary now. But I I still don't think that it's not good to for for someone up here who's worked on Triple a lot to throw out a date. Um, and then a company overhears that and makes business decisions based on that date, and then it turns out to be wrong because the amount of work is different. That's not smart. Um, that's, you know, it, it's not good for business. What businesses probably want to know is, is I think, more what, what, Nat was, what Nat was saying earlier, wh which is when, when should I start thinking about my 2015, 2016 projects being in Drupal 8. Um, and if you have a long, if you have a project that has a long time frame, um, you know, one of these multi-year projects that's going to require a lot of free architecture. Think about doing it in Drupal 8 if you have the resources and the scale um, to do, you know, investigatory development now. 
um, as to when it's actually going to be released. Um, let, let's, let's answer the, the how and when it will be released, right? Um, so right now we've just released the first beta release of Drupal 8. There are going to be numerous additional beta releases as we add in support for an upgrade path, um, as we resolve outstanding critical issues, as we f um, in the, the forward port um, a number of security fixes from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 so that people who are running betas uh, don't have public phone, you know, publicly disclosed vulnerabilities on their sites. Um, there are 100, something like 115, 116 critical bugs outstanding, and all of those bugs need to be resolved before we can release Drupal 8. Um, we fix something like 10 critical bugs a week a lot of the time, um, but we also discover additional ones in that process. So it's a constant narrowing of the funnel. It's not like we're intro we, we introduce some regressions, but a lot of it is more just uncovering smaller related parts of the previous big problem that we had, defining what the scope of work to be done in is better. Um, if you want to keep track of that, um, you can go to groups.dribble.org slash core slash updates. Every two or three weeks we put out um, something that gives you sort of like a weekly tracker of, of how that progress is going. So if, if you're the gambling type and you want to start betting on it, you know, I, I'm not going to make a statement, but go ahead and follow that and then maybe you can make a prediction. Mm -hmm. All right, let's take another question. Oh, hi. Um, I'm Chris Amato from Nectar. Uh, we're a web development firm in Massachusetts. Um, we mostly do, we, we do a lot of partnering with agencies, uh, design firms, ad firms. Um, and my question about D8, um, my role in the company is largely often defining um, the sort of broad architectural parameters of a, of a CMS. Um, so it's sort of content strategy, but a little more than that too. Um, and so my question is, as far as it relates to D8, how will D8 impact um, our agency partners or our end, end customers, direct clients, from um, an architecture standpoint, if at all? Um, should it be, should, should, should clients care, aside from the fact that they're going to have to pay more money to upgrade um, and to stay, to stay secure in the long term? From a site architecture and in, and visioning perspective, does D8 matter to clients? Um, well, it, I think it makes a lot of things, you know, easier. Um, you know, like we put a lot of emphasis. I mean, I'll, I'll take a first crack at the answer. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, you know, we, you know, some of the initiatives around mobile, for example, um, and so out of the box we have um, responsive design for both the front end and the back end. We have web services deeply integrated into the platform. Um, these kinds of things are very relevant, mm -hmm. uh, I believe, for the agencies that increasingly more need to build these you know, great mobile experiences in addition to traditional or more traditional desktop experiences. Can I be a little more specific? Yes, please. So um, <laughs> um, conventionally, we think in terms of content types and views um, as, as interpreters of Drupal for clients that just want to see their content in various places. Um, does that dialogue change much? Like, is, it a, is there a shift that we should, because there's a little bit of client education that goes into every Drupal build project, and we have to do a little bit of, here's what a content type is. It's, you know, we, everybody has their way of describing that to non-technical folks. Does that change, and, and how? So there's been a lot of changes under the hood to these systems, but conceptually, the Conceptual. concepts are the same. Uh, right. Drupal is still very much Drupal. I mean, we yeah. have entities, we have fields and entities. We have made the thing better, and like the things that worked on some parts of the system but not on the other parts of the system are like much more unified. Like mm -hmm. every entity type can be natively translatable. That's a huge mm -hmm. change. Every entity type can be nati natively revisionable. Every fields in the entity type in the entities are. Uh, uh, m manipulated the same way with the same set of tools like widgets, formatters, validators, mm -hmm. um, stuff like that. So the system should be, uh, it's still very much Drupal with the same concepts you know from Drupal 7. Mm -hmm. More unified. Great. Yeah, what we did to entities and views is you have more of them. <laughs> also fields, a lot more of them. So we, so we think those are the key strength of Drupal and we wanted to apply it even more broadly. So custom blocks, menu, menu items, all those things are entities. 
even admin pages are views, so you can customize admin pages for clients without like needing to replace your mm -hmm. existing admin page oh, just great. so you can use views. So it's a lot more flexible in all of those areas. And because Drupal already uh, Drupal already has all of these flexibility built in, then a lot of the modules that you will use will build on this flexibility and will be themselves more flexible so you don't need to do a lot of magic to work around them. Great. Thank you, guys. And j just one more thing. Yeah. It's as I was saying when we were talking about what are the key things that uh, for different people Drupal 8 offers, um, is that not everything needs to be a content type anymore. We need to kind of branch our thinking out and think about entity types. Mm. And, 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 and if it's not content, if it doesn't have to have its own unique URL that you go to, it's a lot easier to do that. Like we have, we have in core, we have the, the block content module where you can like put different bits of content in blocks and put that around. That's not a node. That's, that's a different type of content entity that doesn't have um, a, a URL in the same way that obviously a node does. So, so it's about kind of trying to draw back from making everything a content type to saying actually, what are the things that my site has? Which ones of these are, would, would map nicely into the node entity and which ones don't? And if they don't, then it's worthwhile like, exploring well, where do they fit. That's kind of getting to the essence of my question, which is do we want to steer the conversation away from the term content type in architecting sites from a content strategy perspective? Yeah. Yeah. Because not everything is content. Right. Right. Cool. Yeah, go for it. So, um, I work for a uh, subcontractor of a government project in Norway, which does digital learning. And we have been happily living on D6 for a long time, and we're really happy about seeing uh, what happens to D8, really. Uh, and thank you for that. But um, we are moving everything out on the cloud and doing most stuff restful. So I attended the headless Drupal buff yesterday. And what we wonder, of course, is D9. Um, what are, or are there any plans for decoupling, actually, the back end and the good stuff, and they're getting APIs to getting the core stuff uh, exposed and doing headless stuff? That's my question. Yeah, so we haven't really talked about D9, to be honest. Um, but I will say that um, it would make a lot of sense for us to focus more on decoupling um, and more decoupled architecture. So I, I would say it's very likely that that will be an ongoing goal, and maybe even for you know 8.1 and, and you know minor releases in the 8 cycle, um, because that's where things have almost have to go, right? So, and we've we've taken a lot of steps in Drupal 8 to get you know to get much much closer uh, to the, to that already. So I think you can expect to see more, you know, more along that path in, in D8. In the it's, it's actually a huge actu uh, architectural change, really. If, as yeah, I so understood it, the, the theme layer is really closely knitted, so you won't get all the stuff like you know forms and uh, right. whatever country does. And uh, some of these things may have to happen in contributed modules, in eight, yeah. I think. Yes, but we are already at the point that the theme layer does not right. have to be initialized to oh. respond to a REST request, right? So we have moved already in decoupling. I'll bootstrap from the theme there. This is John Alban. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to say that um, exactly what Alex Potts said, um, but in addition to that, we're already, um, just uh, yesterday I saw somebody, uh, Rupal, had created a super lightweight component library API, um, which is for you know, like adding in web components, um, having uh, Drupal being able to populate those web components, and then that, that certainly helps with um, decoupling the front end and the back end. So um, there's definitely a lot of work already happening at this DrupalCon for, uh, in the GitTrib space for that. And it, make, it would make sense to move some of these things over to core, um, you know, whenever we ha we're in Drupal 8.1, maybe 9, we'll, we'll have to figure that out. More questions? Yes, uh, hello, I'm Nils van der Molen uh, from GoGorilla. <coughs> we make uh, the Greenpeace uh, Greenwire website, a social platform for Greenpeace. Um, I have a question about the documentation of, uh, of Drupal 8 for, uh, mostly. Uh, will there be a priority and uh, something like a cookbook uh, or a book uh, with examples and uh, that makes all the stuff a little bit easier to read and uh, to learn? 
or, or where can I find it if it's already there? <laughs> so, so on Drupal.org, there's already a Drupal 8 APIs section that has some of the APIs pretty well fleshed out. So, for example, all the YAML-based things, if you need to do routing or menus, tab tabs, sections, whatever, uh, that's very well fleshed out. The entity section is also pretty, um, pretty well detailed with concrete examples of what you would do in certain cases. Uh, there's other areas where we just made so many changes that we still need to uh, get there. And then there's Alex already mentioned Jennifer Hudson's already writing wi writing her book for Drupal 8 development. So there's uh, already those uh, in the pipeline. I don't know when it's slated to release, but um, not in not next week certainly because we'll still change a few things. So they will not put that in print yet. I think you can expect there to be, you know, a variety of books on Drupal 8. Uh, maybe not on the day Drupal 8 is released, but uh, you know. Shortly after, I think you'll start to see books coming out. I think for Drupal Seven, there's there must be at least 50 books or something uh, by now. Yeah. And I don't I don't see any reason why we wouldn't see that with Drupal Eight. Yeah, but I think it could be uh, a little bit better to have it also on the home page mm -hmm. and uh, and just uh, you know available and right. visible. Absolutely agree that we need to to have Drupal Eight documentation available, easily discoverable. Um, the Drupal 8.0 page is actually linked directly off of the front page of Drupal.org, and from there you can get to this API documentation that Gabor describes. However, as he said, it's some parts of it are dumb, some parts of it are very stale, or refer to like 2012 versions of the API. Um, if anyone, we need help with documentation. We need people who um, will will look and maybe ask a few questions of, of developers who know things about documentation and then turn around and and help flesh out and finish that documentation that's something that we need um, I, I hope I'm hoping there's I think that there's a sprint going on on Friday where people would be working on documentation for Drupal 8 um, the best thing to do is, is look for something that's wrong I know in the configuration system we need we need a lot of help there's there's some um, some great features of the configuration API that are very important to people who are thinking about how they're going to develop and deploy configuration that really aren't documented in a comprehensive way yet, and we could definitely use um, help with that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. For me, it's a bit high. Uh, my name is Ronnie Van Es. I'm from the Moon Groen, uh, stationed here in Amsterdam, a uh, Drupal agency. Um, I asked a question uh, just Tuesday at the Q&A uh, at you about funding, crowdfunding. Uh, I'm still hearing here as well uh, that keeping a team together and keeping the velocity going is a big, uh, big problem. So I had a follow-up question for you. So I don't know if it's, it's really for core, but we all have to. It's relevant to it's relevant. many of it's us, relevant. all of us, really. <laughs> um, uh, you talked about tracking agencies and end users and contributors uh, in, in maybe with an idea. Um, with, with the tracking in place, um, um, I'll, I'll read it because with tracking in place with current entities within the Drupal community, um, can uh, within the Drupal uh, community can be assigned to start working on a scalable funding system that supports the eventual. Well, this is gr this isn't going to work. Uh, I'm just thinking about. How can can you uh, work within the community? Work, can can you find uh, responsible for starting an initiative to get funding off the ground, like uh, like the initiatives you talked about, uh, technical within Drupal? I think there should be an initiative for funding and how to set up funding, how to create maybe an organization to uh, uh, enable us as developers to uh, apply for funding. Do you have an idea about that? I know there is large scale, scale Drupal, which combines businesses, uh, but that's the thing I'm wondering about. How how can we get that to be an initiative? Sure. Um, yeah. So we do some of it with the large scale Drupal initiative, which I can talk a little bit more about if if you want. Um, the Drupal Association uh, will likely also help a little bit with funding, connecting people that are willing to donate. Uh, and you know, connecting them to those that are looking for donations. I think sort of a matchmaking role is probably something that the Drupal Association can do, and most likely will do at some point. Um, and you know, 
So but, okay, but then, uh, as I understood during the session on Tuesday, mm -hmm. a lot of people face a lot of administrative, financial burden when they actually find or uh, find funds or find uh, businesses interested. Um, so what what we discussed was you actually need like a company or or an organization to not only combine uh, the network but also facilitate. Yeah, so that that's effectively what I'm trying to do with the lar large scale Drupal initiative. So if people can join, um, they pay a fee to join the program, starting at eight thousand dollars, but it can go up. Um, and as part of that, you join. Um, a community of other organizations that are interested in contributing to Drupal and making Drupal better. And some of the money goes to um, or the organization of you know, large-scale Drupal and paying for um, these administrative costs and, and, and the fundraising costs and the likes. Uh, but what's left um, is designed to go back to Drupal itself and to help fund um, the kinds of projects that the members of the large scale Drupal initiative um, you know, want to fix. So yeah. they, they sort of get together and they say, well, here's my challenges and here's my challenges and here's my challenges and we compare them and look for overlap between these challenges. And so we funded through large scale Drupal, we have you know, funded a number of things. Um, for example, there's quite a few media companies in the large scale Drupal initiative and they wanted to have uh, they wanted to see improvements to the way they do, you know, publishing, and, and specifically around workflows. And so that actually has funded, uh, you know, work in the contributed module space uh, to give them better, you know, editing workflow tools. And some of these things went back into, um, I think it's called Workbench, the Workbench module. Um, so we, we're doing these kinds of things yeah. um, as part of, you know, an, an Acquia initiative, but it is open to every company to join. Yeah, um, I know it's an Acquia initiative, so I think it's important to not only <coughs> get it from the business-wise, but also um, promote uh, people in the community, mm -hmm. uh, promote to them how they can use the this Drupal Lodge, so, uh, Lodge Drupal Association, and how they can um, pay the, uh, give attention to their problems and their needs for funding. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be the only solution. Like, I definitely encourage others to start their own initiatives. Maybe there's a need for a small Drupal initiative, you know, or some things like that. Um, so definitely encourage people to self-organize, to start these. Um, maybe the future, this is where the Drupal Association could play a more prominent role as well in, in trying to uh, be, um, you know, a center for fundraising and, and help sort of take money from organizations and then distribute it somehow um, to all sorts of different initiatives in Drupal. Okay. Um, my, the reason I, I talked, in my keynote I presented an alternative model, right, which is in exchange for actually contributing, you get like something in return versus you contribute and then we'll do something. And the reason I propose that is because one of the lessons learned with large scale Drupal and having a you know, organization that does fundraising is that it's very hard. And I think a lot of people underestimate how much work it is. Like we literally have lots of people trying to raise money for large-scale Drupal with some success. Um, but the, um, you know, it, it's very expensive, frankly, to run that initiative because we need salespeople to go and raise the money. And like, it's not something like you create a little organization but, that, say but that's the same thing the developers encounter when they want funding. Oh, they yes. encounter exactly the same problems. That's what I noticed uh, this week. Right. So. so it's not the magic bullet right now. It, 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 you know, maybe it will be, uh, but it takes time to build that fundraising muscle, if you will. Yeah. Uh, and that's not some, I mean, we've been doing this for, um, I think it's almost three years now, um, if not longer. Uh, and so after three years and a lot of hard work with dedicated people on the large-scale Drupal initiative, we have been able to grow it um, to a respectable size, but it wouldn't, it's not at a stage where it's the solution to sort of, you know, the problem that we have. So just to give you a sense, if, if we were to start alternative mechanisms today, it will probably take years for them to, to mature. Uh, and I definitely encourage you to, to talk to Michael Myers uh, he's actually in the back right there. 
And so Michael is heading up the large-scale Drupal initiative. Um, and so if you want to tap his brain, <laughs> I will. On, on like, you know, okay. I definitely encourage you to. And so that's that's why I proposed what I proposed in my keynote because I think um, it's easier, and we can do it faster. Yeah. Um, I, th I think it's going to be a combination of both. Yes, I, and I fully yeah. agree. Like, I don't think there's one magic bullet. I think it's we need different kinds of initiatives, all the way from GitHub on the one hand, where people raise uh, you know small amounts of money, hundreds of dollars a week, right, to uh, this incentive-based program on D2O, where we give people more visibility and, and more re rewards for contributing to providing a, a, a mechanism for organizations to donate as well, because not everybody wants to contribute by giving time. For some organizations, it's easier to contribute by giving money, yeah. right? And so we also need to uh, sort of allow for that. And so we need to start building out all of these things to keep up with, with the growth of the project. Thank you. And just, just to add to that, I think we also need to get better at saying what we need money for. Like, like for, for myself, I, I spend a lot of time like saying, hey, I need a job to help me work, work, on, work on Drupal 8. But there were other people, there were other funding needs. Like throughout the Drupal 8 release cycle, we've had several different things happen. We've had like the, the views in core chip in that raised only $10,000 for like one of the- 13. 13, oh, sorry, $13,000 for like the biggest contributed module to, to move into Drupal 8. Um, that's not enough money to migrate views into core. Um, and, and so we, we need to get a, a better way of saying, here are our targets, here's what we need money for, and then fundraising for it, and using all of the different routes that we have. We have LSD, which is like targeted at large, large Drupal users. Um, we, we have no way for like all of the, the, the hundreds of like small, smaller agencies of like 10 to 20 people to, <coughs> to, to help, help us do that. Um, we always assume that those people will, in their spare time, contribute time to, to, to fixing the problems. But maybe they don't have that time. Maybe they have a, have a couple of thousand dollars that they put into a bucket altogether. And so, so with, with the multitude of efforts, then that, that would be one way to get the, the money. But we need to be clear on what we're fundraising for. And that's, that's another change that we need to make. Because at the moment, it's, it's very, very piecemeal. No one, no one knows why we need money. We say we need money. but, but who knows why? I mean, I know why. I, I, we need money to pay for people to, to organize the initiatives because it's, it's really hard to get someone to volunteer their time every week to check in with a whole team of people to organize over a couple of years the, the amount of work that it takes to get something done in Drupal Core. Um, but, but we're not saying that to anyone. So yeah, we need to get better in at that. In addition to that, we should also fish in a bigger pool. Um, for the nations because it's always the same like 50 or so companies that people go to to raise money um, And that's that's where we and so people often say oh Wikipedia uses you know fundraising and donations very effectively, but and they do right they raise millions But it's because the people that go to Wikipedia are the end users um, And in our case our community has this extra layer in between where the Drupal contributors they work for the Drupal shops and the Drupal shops build websites for the end users and we're, we almost never raise money from the end users and so that's a big difference from Wikipedia where pe they can go straight to the end users and as a result they have this massive pool of people to tap into and so somehow we're kind of stuck um, you know going to the Drupal shops which in a, is a relatively small set of organizations today well it's a large set of organizations but the ones you can actually get to um, is relatively small I would say and, and just to add to that this is where I'm really excited about the ideas of, of um, marking out which agencies and which end users are, are, are contributing best back to Drupal because then we can get like a, a virtuous cycle where people are looking for for agencies to do work for them they can pick them based on their their efforts to sustain the Drupal community. Because if you're making a bet on Drupal, you'll probably want your site to last five, six years. You want to know that that, that that agency that you've used to build you the site is, is, is invested in that future. You don't want just a free rider. You don't want George or whoever it was. <laughs> All right, great. Let's move on to another question, maybe. Hi, uh, Matt Smith from Lingotech. And first of all, thank you for doing the Q&A. This is one of my favorite parts of 
coming to DrupalCon is listening and hearing these these issues being discussed. So appreciate that. Uh, my question is, uh, traditionally upgrading from you know D6 to D7, D7 to D8, it's been you know really painful um, and kind of isolated, kind of a new product each time. Uh, have you considered a more continuous model so that upgrades are just they're smaller and and you know people can just move forward and Drupal is Drupal and they're not really thinking about the version as much. So, um, so in terms of like developing contributive modules, once 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 Drupal Seven was released, about two months later, Drupal Eight was released, and we immediately started breaking like Drupal Seven core bashes. When Drupal Eight is released, Drupal Nine will not be open, and we'll release eight, release eight point one, and then eight point two, and then somewhere between like eight point two and eight point <coughs> four or five we will open Drupal 9. But, but before we get there, there will be refactoring done to Drupal 8. Like things that can be done in Drupal 8 will be done. Like if someone's got time to do it, and it's possible to do it without completely breaking everything, we will do an absolute best effort to do it and replace like the old crafty things that we've done. And then when Drupal 9 opens, then you just rip out the old crafty stuff. So if you've got a Drupal 8 module where you've kept up to date with 8.4, that might still work. I mean, it might not work when Drupal 9 is out, but it should work like the first two or three months, probably. Um, with what the scope of changes will be in Drupal 9, no one really knows. I think something like the Entity and Field APIs is, is probably not going to change that much. The database layer has not changed that much since Drupal 7. That's like Drupal 7 and 8 is not that much different. So some of these things are getting locked down. There are other things like the random and form system that are probably going to be revisited and changed quite a lot because they, they've, they've fundamentally not changed that much since Drupal 6. So uh, I don't think there will be an end to large API breaks because you do have to do that sometimes, otherwise you really get stuck in some very bad places. But the scope of those changes from the major releases should be smaller and there will be longer periods where you can like incrementally introduce new things and allow modules to get up to date um, in a much like more structured way. And then when we do break things, it's the only reason we'll, like we'll break this and this and this and this and those things and other things will be left. And then you get that out and then you incrementally improve again and do that. So I, I'm not sure, so I don't think it's possible to stay on Drupal 8 forever. It doesn't feel like that to me. I know some people would like that, but it's going to be more like that than it has been, and we can progressively get better and better at doing this. The like the more things we get to like how we like <coughs> the architecture, then we can make changes under the hood without breaking everyone's stuff. So the answer for to your question is yes. Good, um. <laughs> and, and we have for for context for what Nat was saying um, that we we did uh, decide um, at the beginning of this year to adopt a new uh, release cycle model. So it's 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 um sort of similar, uh, we, we sort of based our original brainstorming on, on uh, what Ubuntu does. Um, and so these, these 8.1, 8.2 that Nat is talking about are six month releases, regular scheduled six month releases. And um, after several of those, we have a long term support release that will be supported for many years. Um, first, first with bug fixes, and then um, once, once Drupal 9 is released, it will receive security fixes still after that, so. Thank you. All right, one more question, and then I think we're out of time. Um, well, the first an impression, I guess, you know, about the funding that was discussed earlier, I guess I'm making the same observation that a lot of people do, that the same company that is easily willing to spend a five-figure number on some Microsoft certification is giving a hard time for a three-digit number support for a local Drupal camp. So maybe that could change at some point. I have no idea how, but the money is there for software to support, sadly not always on Drupal. Um, the question that I have is um, a bit vague. Um, it's about tools. Um, um, I'm, I tried to work with, with Eclipse some years ago and it never worked out, so we split up and I'm back to using somewhat of a text editor. Um, my impression is that the PHP Storm becomes somewhat of a soft requirement. Any, any thoughts about that? I still mostly use Emacs, but I have started sort of tasting the forbidden fruit of an IDE in the form of PHP Storm. There are still developers who don't use it. It's not, it's not a requirement. 
Um, but in Interblade, it does, it, you know, 16 years of Emacs and Interblade is making me use an IDE. So it, it does, it makes your life a little more sane. Maybe let's go requirement. from Gabor to here, and they'll, they can tell you what their favorite tool is that they work in, and then we'll have to wrap it up because we literally have one minute left. So let's just quickly go uh, left to right. Let us know what you're developing. Yeah, I adopted PHP Storm. I still use Vim, but I like one day I'm probably going to install IDE, but I'm holding out as long as I possibly, possibly, possibly can. Uh, what will you do when the time comes when PHP Storm starts to, you know, rip us off because, you know, we depend on them? Uh, that's that's partly why I'm holding out. It's like I if if I can't if I can't do it easily, then I can complain about it and once I'm using an idea I won't notice anymore. <laughs> so it's like and I I would like other people who want to hold out to be able to do that. <laughs> So I, I use PHP Storm, but I've had some really good conversations with a, a fellow member of Chapter 3 who's, who loves his Vim. And it's about, you, you just need to learn how to set it up. Like there's, there's some great plugins for Vim that will give you a lot of the same features that you can find in PHP Storm. Like if you know how to set up C tags, you, you get a, a load of code completion that, that you have in PHP Storm. It's, it's just that it's more hard to teach people to set it up. So. Well, really shortly, like, yeah, PHP Storm 2, because, like, it's, like, the, the click and install solution that makes just working with a, a large OO code base, like, really easy and navigate between the classes and implementations and overrides and stuff like that. It's, yeah, it's really great. Uh, I continue to use text editors, plain text editors, uh, until four or five months ago, but now PHP Storm. <laughs> Um, I use mail. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I don't get to code anymore, or not much. And when I do, it's usually VI, to be honest. Um, so, but I don't think I'm, I'm a, a reference. <laughs> so, all right, awesome. I think we're out of time. Thanks for all the questions. <laughs> Thanks to all the panelists here as well. Thanks for making the time.